So last time David uh, mentioned adjunctions, and we decided that uh, adjunctions are important. So we'll we'll talk about adjunctions today, uh, and also adjunctions require natural transformations. And David mentioned natural transformation some time ago. So it's time to refresh uh, a little bit our understanding of natural transformation and get some uh, idea about wha what, what they are about. So um, you can think of, we, we talked about functors uh, as being these things that, that you know, embed some interesting shapes in, in a category. So like if you have an arrow category and you have a functor from it, it will pick an arrow, right? It can pick one arrow, it can pick some other arrow, right? There are many ways of picking arrow in, in, a, in, a, in a category, right? Uh, but what happens when you have a more complicated category, bigger category here that you are, that you are f using a functor from, the, the, your source category? Um, then, then it's more like, it's, it's not just a simple shape, it's more like a um, blueprint for something, okay? So you have a blueprint to creating something, and then you are modeling it in a different category. Maybe you are shrinking something, simplifying, you know, but you are putting it in some bigger context and so on. So this is, this is a way of modeling things. And very often the second category is set. We are putting models in set. And this is actually something that Brandon will be talking about when, when he talks about adjunctions, the naturality in set. Um, so, so let's imagine that we have like a very simple, uh, you know, blueprint for, for an animal with four uh, things sticking out, right? And, and we, are, we are creating a model of it, and one, one, one model of this is a, is a human, you know, and another one is, is a, a dog, you know. <laughs> right? <coughs> so we can have many models of the same category. Uh, and the question is, are these models somehow related, right? In particular, maybe, maybe they are even isomorphic. It's very interesting to have isomorphic models. So we need some kind of morphisms between these models to say if they are isomorphic. Or maybe there's a morphism only in one direction, right? Like one model is like much more detailed and the other is like very rough sketch, right? So, um, so what would it mean to have a, a map? A, a mapping between these two models. It would mean, okay, so this is the head of this guy. Let me use some color, maybe, you know. So it is mapped into the head, okay? So object will go under one functor, it will go into another object. Under the other functor, this head object will turn into the head object of a dog, right? But then we have so, so this, is, this is what the functor does on object. But it also works on um, morphism. So a morphism means that there is some kind of um, connection, right, relation between, let's say, the head of this guy and his hand, right? And it goes through a morphism <laughs> through the neck and, and the arm, right? So, so this, this hand is mapped here under one functor and it's mapped into the paw of the dog under the second functor, right? And now we want to say, well, that there is this connection here, this is this morphism F between the head and the hand, okay? What does this correspond here? Well, you, you just lift it using the functor, right? So you'll get a morphism here from head to hand. Right? So this is F acting on F will give you this connection. The other morphism, which I will call G, right, uh, will map, map the dog's head to its paw. Right? So this is G acting on the same F. Right? 
So if we want to uh, have the connection uh, a, a mapping between these two models, right, then first of all, we have to map this, another color, this head to this head, right? So we have to find a morphism in this category that goes from FA, so if this is A, you know, from FA to GA. GA is the dog's head, right? Okay. And the same will happen for, for the hand, right? The hand to paw. Another morphism. So a natural transformation is this family of morphisms between the two models. Sometimes the morphism doesn't exist in this category. Maybe this is like separated totally. Then these two models are totally unrelated and we cannot say anything. But in some cases there is, we can find a nice family of morphisms, right? And we'll say we have a transformation. But is this transformation natural? Not yet. It will be natural if it also works on morphisms, right? So notice what happens like uh, with, with morphisms. We can go from the head to the hand of the human using FF, right? By, by lifting this morphism. And then we could follow it using the natural transformation. And this is a family of natural transformation that is indexed by, by, ob by objects in this category. So if this is A, th this is alpha A. So if we call this natural transformation alpha, this is its component at A. So a component of the natural transformation is this morphism that corresponds to this object. This is alpha at B, where B is this object right? And so on. So for every object here there is a morphism between two models. Okay? So we can go from head to hand and then do the natural transformation and we end in at this paw. Good. But we can also go from head to dog's head using the, the, the natural transformation and then we have this morphism, the blue thing, right? lifted using G and we end up at the paw. So do we want these two things to be different or do we want them to be the same? Yes? Uh, what are A and B? So A is the like original head and B is the original hand. <laughs> right? Th these are objects in, 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 uh, in the first category, in the source category. Objects. Yeah? any two objects, right? So for every object here, we, ha we have something that's mapped in this category, right? So we want this diagram to commute, okay? So I'm going to draw this diagram, now, now I'm back to white, okay? So, <clears throat> so for any morphism F from A to B in our original tar source category, um, we can go from A, FA to FB using the lifted morphism F, right? We can lift it. Uh, then we have the other functor, G, right? So we can do the same with G. When we lift F using G, sorry, G, right? Then we go from GA to GB. That's just lifting, which we call f-map in uh, Haskell, right? So we are f-mapping f, f-mapping f, using two different factors, okay? And then we have natural transformation, a component of natural transformation, alpha a, and here's a component of natural transformation, alpha b. All of these things are morphism in the second category, right? So we can compare them. So we can say, we want this thing to commute. Okay, or check mark, right? Okay. So how do we express this stuff in, in Haskell? Um, 
it's actually very simple because this is just like, okay, it's a family of, uh, so this will be a family of functions that's parameterized by an object. For every, ob for every object, every type, there has to be one function, right? That's called a polymorphic function. So really, this is like a polymorphic function. In Haskell, we can write this whole family of morphisms as, as a single polymorphic function. And we don't even need a data type for it. We can just say uh, it's, it's a type uh, synonym. It's a synonym. Uh, and we can say type not of between f and g, two functors, two type constructors in Haskell, right? And it's equal to a, f a polymorphic function. So it, it will have to work for, for all A, for all objects A, for all types A. It's a, it's a mapping from FA to GA, OK? Now, in this case, I have to use this for all. So this is like a, an example where for all is really required. Because if I, if I don't put this, then, then the compiler will say, what, what is A? Where did you get A from? <laughs> right? I mean, either you put A on this side, and then it's fixed, or you put it on this side for all. So it means for every A, there is, there is a function. Right? So I'll give you an example in a moment. But, but first, let me give you some intuition, programming intuition. Okay. The programming intuition is this. Um, you can think of a functor. I, I, I told you that like in Haskell, when you have a type constructor, right? You construct a, a, a value of certain type, and this value will remember how it was constructed. Because it's a functional language. So there is no mutation, right? So you construct it, and it holds this value. You can access it, for instance, using pattern matching. For most of these types, it was a reasonably easy thing to just pattern match and get it out back. Right? So in this way, a, an endofunctor is like a container. You put something stuff, some stuff in when you construct it, and it stays there. It stays fresh. It's like a refrigerator. Okay? It keeps keeping it fresh. Like in, um, uh, in an imperative language, you know, the stuff will spoil, right? Because it can mutate, right? But in a functional language, it always stays fresh. <clears throat> so, two, having two different functors means having two different ways of packing stuff into a container. Right? So you have like a crate of apples and you have a sack of oranges, right? These are two different containers. Um, and there are two ways of dealing with these containers. One is using, using fmap. When you use fmap, you are saying, okay, I have a crate of apples and I'm going to modify these apples by, let's say, changing them into oranges magically something or biting an apple and putting it back right so there is there is a way of transforming the contents of a container without changing the shape right the shape remains the same and a natural transformation on the other hand does it like an orthogonal thing it says uh, okay I'm not really interested in whether this is an apple or an orange or whatever right I just know how to repackage stuff from this container to this container, right? From a crate to a sack, right? But I'm not looking at the objects at all. Um, so how can you guarantee that a natural transformation will not be peaking at like, oh, this is an apple, and this is a red apple, this is a green apple, I'm going to put it somewhere else because it's different. Right? The, the way to, to guarantee it is to say, okay, I'm going to first replace all the apples with oranges and then let you repackage it. You repackage oranges. 
right? And then I'm going to say, okay, I now repackage the apples, repeat the same experiment, but now re repackage the apples, and then, after you did this, I will turn these apples into oranges. I should get the same thing at the end, right? If this is a natural transformation. And this is the important part, that these two things must be orthogonal. One is changing contents, the other is changing shape, right? And the way to guarantee is to say naturally, na naturality square has to be preserved. And in Haskell, it happens so that because this is a polymorphic function, so there is parametric polymorphism in Haskell, meaning that there is a single formula that should work for all types. If it's a single formula, then it has no way of looking at the contents of A, right? There is nothing it could do, like, it cannot add one to it because sometimes support adding one, other types don't, okay? So there is no way of looking at it, so it is automatically natural. And this is in fact true. Every polymorphic function in Haskell is automatically natural. The naturality condition is the, called the so-called theorem for free from parametricity. Okay? So that works. Um, so an example, now unfortunately the, the, it's a problem with examples now because we, we don't know a lot of functors yet because we are like postponing the interesting functors until we can talk about algebra, like the recursive things, like lists, you know. Uh, we just want to, you know, wait until we know about uh, fixed points of algebras. But I'm going to peek at the, at the lists a little bit. So there is a function in, uh, in Prelude, in the uh, library, called head. And head is a function that takes a list of A's, okay, so it's for all A, it's a, it's a natural, oh, well, we'll see if it's a natural transform. It returns an A. Right? Uh, and, uh, wh what kind of A is the returns? Well, it returns the head of the list. So a list contains a head and a tail. Right? But what if this list is empty? When this list is empty, the head will explode. <laughs> right? Your program will terminate with an error. So this is a, like a, a, not a total function. Um, that's, a, that's a bad thing. Right? Uh, but for performance reasons, it's useful. But if we want to make it, um, if we want to make it safe, let's say we want to implement safe head, then we have to go from a list of A to maybe A. And the idea is, if the list is empty, we'll return nothing. <coughs> Okay, now it's a total function, right? So this is really a natural transformation between two functors. One functor is list. List is a functor, right? I mean, we haven't talked about it, but like imagine that you have a list of apples and you have a function that turns apples into oranges. You just apply this function to every apple in the list, right? And you get a list of oranges. So that's what lifting a function means, right? So it is really a functor. <coughs> and this is a maybe functor. And we've seen that this is a functor, right? So between these two functors, we can implement this. And, and if you know like, how to pattern match on a list, you can implement this yourself. I'm not going to do this for you. OK, final thing that I'm going to talk about and then give it to, yes? I'm having trouble corresponding the notation on the right to that image. I have one notion of natural transformation from that, and there's this other notion where I don't see it. <laughs> OK, so fir first of all, we don't have two categories in Haskell, so it will be an endofunctor. Okay. So this thing will be in the same category as this thing, right? So this is, this, is, this is the whole category of husk. This is like the whole husk. So this maybe is n 
now now it's like we are modeling this whole Haskell inside Hask, right? So the blueprint is like really the whole thing. But you can think of I'm taking this whole Hask and turning it into a like a thingy that is uh, lists of A's. So for any A in Hask. Is that what capital F would be? List? List. Yes. Be yeah, exactly. So this is list and G is maybe. What about alpha A and alpha B? Alpha A and alpha B? This, this alpha will be safe head. And A and B oh. just correspond to this for all A. It's just like alpha is the same formula for every A, right? This is parametricity, the same formula. Okay, yeah, good question, yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that explains it a little bit. Okay, so the final, yeah? Oh. Uh -huh. No, no, and endo func okay, there's huge difference between functor and morphism. A functor takes a, an object and gives you another object, okay? It's like, uh, a morphism is, like, if you look at set, okay? Here's a set, here's another set, right? It's a function on sets. Set to set, set to set, set to set. A, f a morphism here would be take this set and for every element find me an element in the other set. So it's element by element, element by element, right? And you can have many morphisms between these two, right? right. Okay. But the functor tells you take this whole thing and this is the corresponding whole thing here, right? Yeah. This is why it's kind of easier to, to see it as a two different categories because then there is no confusion. Like there is no morphism here. This is not a morphism. Just take an object, get an object. Okay, final thing. <laughs> um, so we have, we have these natural transformations between functors, right? Um, when we have something that transforms things like it, it's a mapping between functors, right? Uh, can we compose these things? What do you think? Like if we have three functors. Because every component is a, is a morphism, you know, and we can compose morphisms. We can easily compose these things, right? Is there a, like an identity natural transformation? Sure, take a functor, you know, and then use the identity morphism for your natural transformation, right? So you can take a functor and map it to the same functor using identity natural transformation. So if you have composition and identity, and obviously the laws will apply, it's easy to check, then there is a category there hidden, like, right? So what is this category? It's a, it's a category of functors. You have, a cat, you have functors between category and C and, C and D form their own category. It's like we were thinking of functors as arrows. That was wrong. Functors are objects now, okay, in this <laughs> functor category. These are objects, F and G. Morphisms are natural transformations between these functors. So this is a functor category. Now I'm going to give the microphone. OK. Um, so the aim of the, the, the next half hour is to, to give you a, a definition of a junction, and then to see some examples of them, and then to extract some natural transformations from them. Um, so let's, let's go back to, to where we ended yesterday with this notion of, of currying. So, David sort of spoke about how there's this correspondence between functions that take a pair, that take two arguments, and functions that are these higher order functions that return a function, right? Um, so we call the process of, of going from here to here 
currying. Um, and then, for lack of a better word, we call the reverse direction uncurrying. Right. Um, oopsies. I have Ys. I need Ys in curry. Um, so a historical note is that this, this, why is this called currying? Um, so there was this logician, Haskell Curry, who Haskell is named after, and currying is also named after him. Uh, it's sort of not a coincidence uh, that, that this is sort of a, a fundamental thing in Haskell, right? So Haskell's viewpoint is that functions are automatically curried. Currying is, is built in. Um, so you might write a function of two arguments like this, but in Haskell, it's sort of, you, you can write it without the parentheses and sort of tautologically these are the same things because this, this notation is built in. Um, so so Curry's observation was we, we've met the sort of lambda calculus and we've met the notion of types and there's this thing, this restriction of the lambda calculus known as the simply type lambda calculus. And his observation, one of his many, was that um, if you're in a world that allows currying, you have in some sense a, enough structure to really interpret the simply type lambda calculus. And so this is sort of a fundamental thing in that sort of, to, to interpret that sort of programming language. Um, so, but what I want to focus on today is this sort of correspondence. Let me translate this into a sort of more mathematical categorical notation. So we're looking at, I'm just, say we have a category C and not all categories support this kind of structure, but, but say that it does. So we have in particular these objects, these product objects, we can write A times B. Um, and we can think about the morphisms from A times B to C. And then we also have uh, this thing called an exponential object, which I'm going to write C to the B, right? which we think of as sort of representing the, the collection of morphisms from B to C. That's it. Um, and so what currying says, or what this, what's called sort of, a, I guess an internal Homa junction says, is that there's a correspondence between these two. So this is just this picture translated into a different sort of categorical notation. And the picture we've used orange for functors, so maybe I'll continue that. So the, the perspective that I want to promote here is that we've picked some object B, um, and that this thing is, is a functor. Uh, that sort of takes A and returns A times B. So if we pick string, like David did in a previous lecture, there's a functor called sort of the, the writer functor that sort of spits out a, a string as we go through a computation. Uh, we can also think of this thing here as a functor. It takes an object C and returns the object C to the B. Um, and, and sort of uh, from a, a computational perspective, as we'll see uh, in next week and the week after, is that this this might be called the reader functor because what it does is it returns this type that sort of reads in a B. It's got this arrow in from B. Right. And so we have, these, we have this, this structure here where we're looking at relating A and C, but we put it through two different functors um, on, on either side of this, this sort of bijection, this isomorphism. And that's sort of the flavor of a, an adjunction, but an adjunction also has this naturality condition. So, let me give you a more formal definition. Definition. An adjunction um, is, firstly, two categories. Um, so I'm going to check my notation. What did I want to do? I'm going to call them C and A. And then we have two functors between them going in other directions, uh, in opposite directions. So this function, functor going leftwards is called L for left, and this Functor going rightwards is called R for right. Um, so it's, it's this structure together with um, uh, for every, yeah, with isomorphisms. So for every object A and A and C and C, we get these isomorphisms from C of, from the set CL. Okay. So we're trying to, we have a C and C. And we have an A in A, right? These are objects. Um, and now we're trying to relate to these, these two objects, but they're in different categories. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to 
I can relate them in C by t using this functor L and putting this A into C. And so I get this problem set. And I can also do the other side. If I want to relate them in the category A, I can take my object A. And then I can also take my object C and C and put it through the functor R to get over there. And so what I want for an adjunction is a bunch of isomorphisms of this sort um, that are natural, in the sense of natural transformation, in these sort of A and C, which are these variables. So for all, blah. So here, this natural transformation is sort of accepted one variable, so it was alpha sub A. But here, there's sort of two subscripts, an A and a C. There was a question back there. Is that still open? Yes, I should have. It's best if I'm a bit more precise. So I think we wrote OBJ for objects. So I'm going to write C in objects A, C, and A in the objects of A. Thanks. Another question? Right. So an adjunction is an asymmetric. So the question is why we chose sort of this direction, LA to C rather than C to LA. Um, and, and the same for the other, other thing here. Uh, and that's, it's an asymmetric concept. And th this happens to be the definition that sort of we'll see lots of examples of that works really well. Um, there are sort of, you can make sort of deeper arguments why, you would, why this thing should be more interesting than maybe if I switch these two arguments. But I won't go into that at the moment, and we can talk about that after. Uh, OK. So the example here is that this, this functor L, this functor times B is the functor L. So LA equals A times B, and then R of C is equal to C to the B. OK. Let me say a tiny bit about what this sort of natural in A and C means. Um, uh, I'm going to just talk about naturality in C. Um, so this says, just like this, if we pick some f and it's going to go from sort of C to C prime, then some square has to commute. Right? So what is this square? Well, we have, we can sort of pick the component at AC, and that's this one above. I'm just copying this down here. But we can pick the component at C prime. Um, and then I'm just going to copy this down here, but put primes wherever we saw our C, C prime instead of we, wherever we saw our C. So. And, but there's also a map um, in here that sort of takes this set, takes a, a morphism from LA to C, and turns it into a morphism from LA to C prime. That's given by this f. And what is that map? Well, I have something. If I have x from LA to C, I can just compose x with f. And then I put this sort of to C prime here. And then I get a map down here in from LA to C prime. And similarly, on this side, I can compose with R of f. Right? So if I have a map from A to RC, I compose with RF. And I get the map from A to RC prime. And so the naturality here says that this thing commutes. Okay. There's naturality in the other variable as well. Uh, and it, you have a similar diagram. One caveat is that it's, it's contravariant. So there's a, a strange direction swap. But I won't get into that at the moment. Yep. Sorry, do LA. Mm. So they give us objects. So LA is an object in C. It takes an object in A, but it returns an object in C. Um, the products and exponentials are also objects in the, in the category. Um, there's, there's sort of this, this pun that's going on that we haven't been too clear about with a word like product. Uh, but we've sort of been using it in almost three different ways. We've been using it for an, the, the, the definition I wrote on the board is that it has a product is this thing with two projections. Um, so it's all of that data. But then 
Sometimes you refer to the object at the top of that thing, this sort of A times B object itself as the product. And then there's this third way, which is sort of this, this process of producting. Or uh, the product is something that takes two objects and returns another object. So it's a binary operation. So when I say uh, the product here, I really mean that middle notion, just the product object. But, I, but that is, is confusing. OK. So that's what an adjunction is. Uh, let's see some examples. So in fact, this, this, these last few lectures have been about universal constructions. And so the, the three main universal constructions we talked about that are really important in Haskell, sort of products, coproducts, or sums, and exponentials, or the sort of tensor hum, car carrying adjunction, uh, are all examples of, well, adjunctions. They're universal constructions. So first, uh, let's think about products. So the left adjoint in the product is this function I'm going to call the diagonal map. So uh, here I'm using a notation that we've not used before. Um, we have some category C, so I'm just talking. So you can use this notion of a junction to express what it means for an arbitrary category C to have products. Um, but so here we picked a category C, and now I can form a category C times C by almost what you expect. The objects in C times C are pairs, uh, sort of A, B, of objects in C. And the morphisms, a morphism from AB to A by prime B prime is just a pair of morphisms, so FG, uh, where F goes from A to A prime and G goes from B to B prime. Okay. So that's this category here. And there's a functor called the duplication or doubling functor that takes an object C and C and maps it to just the pair CC, right, which is an object in C times C. Uh, it does the same on morphisms. Now, turns out that this product, now thought of as a, as a binary operation, as a functor, is, is adjoint to this, is right adjoint. So what does this functor do? Um, it maps the pair AB to the object of C, A times B. Um, so Bartosz talked a bit about this when he he mentioned this notion of product as a type constructor, but then he implemented this thing by map, right? Um, which sort of said what happens on pairs of morphisms as well. And that's this, that fact is exactly the functoriality of this construction. So producting forms a, a functor from C times C to C, also known as a functor in two arguments, because it accepts two arguments. So you say by functor as well. OK. So what does this look like in terms of these sort of home set things? Well, it says that we have two categories, C times C and C. And we can pick either an object sort of A, B in that category, C times C, or we can pick an object. And we can pick an object C in C. And we can either apply the left adjoint, the diagonal, or so the duplication, sorry, to C and get that object there. Or we can apply the product to this object and get this here. And what this adjunction condition says is that these two sets are isomorphic. So uh, in, in the pictures we saw the other day, what is a morphism from C to CC to AB? It's a pair of morphisms, one F from C to A, and another G from C to B. Um, and what this is saying is that the correspondence, if I specify to a pair of morphisms here, it's the same as specifying a single morphism from C to A times B. And conversely, every morphism in here can be constructed in this way. So this is David's one-stop stop, one stop shop idea. Uh, if we want to construct a morphism, if we want to buy this pair of morphisms, we can just buy a single pair of morphisms here, single morphism there, uh, and we get that pair. OK? Um, so. That's products. Coproducts also work similarly. They form an adjunction. And in fact, they also form, so here we saw a t product being a right adjoint to uh, the diagonal. So the diagonal is L uh, times is R. If we look for, if we try and make this a left adjoint, in fact, we get coproducts. So let me figure out this diagram. So diagonal will be, sorry, I'm not sure whether I said that right. Diagonal is going to be the right adjoint now. And Coproduct or sum is going to be the left adjoint. Um, and so this is the same functor 
And this functor here maps the pair AB to A plus B. And what we see over here as we interpret this as a, as a bijection between HOM sets is that, again, we have these two categories, C and C times C. Uh, we can pick an object C here or an object A comma B here. We can shove this through the functor to get A plus B, or we can shove this through the func other functor to get C comma C. And there's a, a bijection uh, isomorphism between these two sets. Right? So this is the same sort of idea as the product, but instead of being sort of this was the, uh, I think we called it tuple, um, or pair, maybe. What was the name? Tuple was the, what we called it, right? Uh, so this is the either thing, right? If we have, so, and it's this correspondence between maps out of the sum type and pairs of maps out of the individual types. OK. So there are two examples. Uh, the third example is just to come back to this, uh, this currying adjunction. So to go through that quickly. Now our categories C are both the same. Uh, we, we fix an object B. Um, so in fact, there's an adjunction for every B that we pick. And then the, the left adjoint is times B, and the right adjoint is the exponentiation. Uh, and so I haven't exactly told you how these are functors, but that's something you can check. Um, and it gives this adjunction between home sets, which is over there already. So A times B, C uh, is isomorphic to C, A to the C to the B. OK. So there are three examples. Now what would you do with one of these things? These things are really great. Um, so to foreshadow something that's going to become really important is if you go around, every adjunction gives a monad. So if you go around this, you get a monad on C, and that's something that'll be a fundamental structure in, in sort of talking about side effects in computation. But here's just one simple way uh, to, to use monads. Um, and that's to sort of extract these important natural transformations, sorry, adjunctions, known as the unit and co-unit. Um, so we have here uh, this bijection between HOM sets. And there's a wonderful trick, uh, which is really powerful in category theory, uh, that sort of seems like a, it maybe falls under the name Unita trick, that says that in HOM sets, we in general no, don't know very much about them, right? They could be anything. But the one thing we do know is that they have identity if, if these two objects are the same, they have identity morphisms in them, or they have a single identity morphism. And so we can use that to extract special morphisms in through these sort of bijections. So for example, if I take C equal to LA, this set has an identity morphism, and I can look at where that goes inside this corresponding set here, uh, A. And so remember, C became LA, so that's the object there. And so what it get is a special morphism in here. Uh, so I'm going to call it A to A, and it goes from A to RLA. And this is a morphism in A, if, you, uh, if that's relevant. Uh, and so we call this thing the unit of the adjunction. And in fact, um, the unit, so this is, a, this is actually a bunch of morphisms, right? One for each object A. And so we have this idea of having, a f when we have a family of morphisms, they might obey this naturality condition. Um, and indeed, sort of unit is a natural transformation, is a natural transformation. Um, so it goes from, what does it do? It's called eta, and it goes from one functor, which returns, which takes an object A and returns itself. So that's the identity functor on A. And then it goes to the functor R composed L. Which, sorry, L com uh, R after L, which is a functor from A to A as well. Uh, so usually we use two arrows, and this is similar to this notation <laughs> that was present on the board here. So here, these things are both A, that's the identity, and this is R composed L, R, R after L. Okay. Similarly, you can do the same trick, but on the other side, and you get sort of, you also get a co unit map. Um, but instead, it goes from uh, LR of C to C. And we call this sort of epsilon for some reason. 
So we get these two natural transformations, the unit and the co-unit. Okay. So what are the unit and the co-unit for these three uh, adjunctions? Well, let's see. Um, so the unit for this adjunction says we put uh, AB to be the, the image of, well, to be equal to this thing. So we put AB equals CC. And so we get this map C to C times C. And this is known as the diagonal. Um, and so let's, yeah, let's quickly check that as natural. Uh, what, do, what would that mean? That, uh, uh, in set, if we, let's just talk about it in set because that's quicker. Uh, if we thought about this in set, we'd have a diagonal on C, some set C, and a diagonal on some set D, right? And then we have, if we have a function f, uh, we get also this sort of paired bifunctor maps that, or bimap maps that thing to uh, f times f. Sorry. That may not have been exactly precise, but that's the spirit. So if we take an element in this set C, uh, what does it mean to be natural? Well, we need to check what happens as we go around both sides of this square. So x here maps to the pair xx, and then this ff thing just applies it to each factor. So we get ff. Ff. If we go around this way, x maps to fx, and this diagonal thing just duplicates it. So in fact, they map to the same thing, and that's the naturality of the diagonal. OK. So we can also extract a co-unit out of it. Um, the diagonal is a very important map in uh, math, and it's good to know that it's natural. If we extract the co-unit, it says that we put a times b here. And so what we end up with is a, a map from a times b, comma a times b to a, comma b. Right? So we get a map from a times b to a and a times b to b. So can anyone guess what they are? Right. The first or second is what we called them in the code, or pi 1, pi 2. Um, so you might have sort of observed that somehow this picture didn't pull out pi 1, pi 2 yet. But now they come up as the co-unit of the adjunction. Um, OK. Similar things happen with the, the co-product. Uh, we first, if we do this side of the adjunction, we get this map uh, from, let me copy it down, yeah, AB to A plus B, A plus B. Right. This is just by plugging A plus B in here and seeing where it goes, right? taking the identity and seeing it come over here. Uh, and so we have ma a map from A to A plus B and a map from B to A plus B. And these are the type constructors left, comma, right. So we know they're natural too. Um, and if you do it here, you get this sort of co-diagonal thing, uh, which is kind of like a, it sort of does maybe some control flow thing. It sort of can take two different copies of C and just, say, and just pipe it through. Um, but finally, let's do it over here with this uh, currying adjunction. What is the unit? Well, we put a, a times B here, and then we get a map from um, A to, so C is now A times B, so A times B to the B. And this here is, so what does this map do? In, if we think about it in sets as an analogy, what it does, it takes a value x, um, and then it sends it to the function sort of that accepts a y and gives, returns the pair x, y. So it's this sort of curried pair constructor. And then finally, the co-unit, so we put c to the b for a, <coughs> means that we get a map c to the b times b to c. Um, and so what is this thing? This thing accepts a pair at one of which is a function from b to c, and another is a, a value of b. So I'm punning on that. And we need a value of c. So what do we do? Right. We take fb. So this is just eval. So eval is also a natural transformation. Um, and so I'm going to close right now. It's about time. But maybe a good question to discuss with a, a partner while we while we drift out of the room, is just sort of like, so the claim now that I've said is that eval is a natural transformation. So it's, it's a good idea just to check that the, the theory is giving the correct answer. So check eval is a natural transformation. So what is the naturality square 
um, and does it commute. Uh, thanks. <laughs>